fun to come by the Ollie program. This is such a uh, amazing program for Furman University and for Greenville. And I particularly enjoy the fact that so many people in the program are relatively new to Greenville. How many are in that category, like last five years or so? Oh, good. Okay. I actually thought it might be more hands. Um, that's good. I appreciate that. I'm a nat I am a native of Greenville. Uh, it's kind of an unusual situation. I've been, and I've been mayor a long time, by the way. If you, if you, gather, if you did your math on that, I've been, I've been mayor something like 26 years, something like that. It's just crazy. I, would, I never planned it that way. I would not recommend that as a good retirement investment strategy, by the way, personal finance-wise. <laughs> um, it doesn't pay anything, and um, but I really have had the great pleasure of doing what I love for these past many years. And um, I had one. Uh, hey, George, <laughs> I had at least one really hard-fought election to get elected mayor. I've been fortunate all those many, many terms beyond that. I either have had no opposition or had virtually no opposition. So I must be obviously doing something right. But a lot of stress and strain in between to get there. Let me tell you what. And I'll tell you something else about uh, Greenville has a four-year term for mayor, and we do not have term limits. People actually ask me that. Like, we have term limits. After I tell them I'm mayor 25 years, we have term limits. <laughs> yeah, like 100 years. You get 100 years. Uh, but some cities do. And then some, in fact, North Carolina, until fairly recently, some of the biggest cities in North Carolina, Raleigh, Greensboro, et cetera, when Salem used to have two-year terms for mayors. And, and I, had a, I had a college roommate at Wake Forest who was mayor of Raleigh for a little while, two years, <laughs> and they booted them out of there. And they did that over and over again because you can't get anything done in two years except make people mad. And um, in a serious way, I mean, most of the big projects that I was involved in as mayor in years past, you know, they took, everything took eight or nine years to do it. And, uh, and, and you had to live through the controversy. And I'm, I'll, as I'll tell you in a minute, I mean, frankly, so many things that have worked well that the bigger projects we've done recently have not been as controversial uh, as they were in the early years. Uh, and I, so that's a very perceptive question I get sometimes. Unity Park, for example, people actually raise their hand and say, you know, has that been as, and it's been hard, by the way, as George said, it's been hard, really hard over many years, but is it, it, was it as hard as, as Falls Park? No. Was it as hard as baseball downtown? No. <laughs> Um, because people kind of believe that have confidence in the city now, nothing like some success to give you credibility and we can do things. So nobody appreciates that more than I do that when the city proposes a new project, people by a large number of folks now give us a benefit of a doubt at least that, Hey, maybe they kind of know what they're doing, uh, which is great, but it wasn't like that in the beginning and getting back to term limits. Um, so yeah, false park was so controversial. I could almost tell you this. I could almost say, that the whole process of removing the highway bridge, and you may know we had a highway bridge, four lane highway bridge on top of the waterfall. And it had been there for 45 years. Something like that. So over a generation it had been there. So most people in Greenville, sincerely, I mean this, most people in Greenville did not know we had a waterfall. They did not even know it. And, and if they did have a perception of it, the perception of it was, that as, as people, critics would say to me, it's gonna be embarrassing when you remove the bridge. Why is that? It'd be embarrassing because it's just a trickle over that waterfall. Well, have you seen it? Yeah, I've seen it. They have not really seen it. Uh, and that was prevailing wisdom, I promise you. So had we had an election two years into that process, I, I definitely would have had an opponent. <laughs> and I might have lost. So so Raleigh, poor Raleigh, they've changed the law now. They, they flipped their mayors. They used to flip them. And it was usually over something. They had made a decision about something in Raleigh, and people were hot and mad about it. And they were the ones who were most active. Sounds familiar. And, and they bumped their mayors, like my college roommate, who served two years as mayor of like, enjoyed his two years, and he was out. <laughs> and they did that until they changed the law. So uh, you got to have a couple years for people to, to do a project just to get things on the way. And then, frankly, on the political side, you need time to recover <laughs> and then show people that it's not so bad. Uh, baseball was the same thing. Baseball stadium, uh, we were sued and got hauled into court. And everything <laughs> in the world happened during that baseball stadium until the day it opened, and everybody loved it. But uh, oh no! Uh, but projects are really easier now. I'm not whining about it because I look back and say, "Wow, that was how did the world did I survive those first ten years?" Lord Almighty, it was one thing after another. And um, but it's I, I got a great city council, and I've had a great city council going back several terms now. Um, Good, smart people were basically on the same sheet of music. It wasn't like that when I first became mayor. It wasn't like that at all. I mean, it was me and maybe one council member and everybody else going a totally different direction. 
And for the last 15 years, it's been a council <coughs> that by and large were on the same sheet of music. And that does, I'm so grateful for that. I'm so grateful. George was on council for a while and it was just a pleasure. <laughs> we could talk in code because we knew what we're talking, you know, we know what we're trying to do, which was to make city, Greenville the most beautiful city in America, the most livable city in America, and the most welcoming city in America. So it's an easy strategy to work it that way. So we do, so I've always been a part, I've always believed in having a theme and trying a purpose behind what we're doing, and that helps a lot, um, get you through the rough times. Uh, we have so much on our plate. So when, when Sarah called me about this, she claimed that she did not say, <coughs> She did not say, do not bring a PowerPoint, but somebody told me not to bring a PowerPoint. So you're gonna miss out on all the juicy pictures of all the new buildings and all that good stuff. So I'll just have to describe things to you. I'm blaming Sarah for that. But um, we have a lot on the plate, we always do. Um, the city of Greenville has limited bandwidth to do everything we do. And we, it's amazing we get anything done because we have so much going on, which is a good place to be. And um, as people move here, and want to invest here. And the NCAA tournament just concluded this weekend. It did not hit, it did not come here by accident. <laughs> it was a full, we're, the, we're by far the smallest city in America to host the NCAA, by far. Um, so how do we do it? We had, the, we had the facility that holds 15,000 seats, check the box. We have to have a number, of, you know, 2,000 hotel rooms, check the box. Um, but our big draw is downtown Greenville and just the whole enjoyment of the downtown experience that the NCAA board um, had. We had our great enthusiastic supporters on that board. It's like the perfect city to hold a tournament, but it was a lot to take on. And once again, we got some great exposure and people saw us. And I, um, I, I met people from Philadelphia, Salt Lake City, Denver, all over the country, you know, families and school groups of all kinds, and, and I'll tell you what happens next, because I've seen this before. It's like when we appear in the New York Times or something. You see it, and you go, hey, that's really impressive. Greenville looked good there. About six months later, <clears throat> almost a year later, they started coming. With the first group comes in and says, hey, we first heard about y'all, a New York Times article. Or my cousin went to the NCAA and came back and hadn't quit talking about it. Um, I'll tell you a true story on that one that doesn't happen. No, I, I, go to, I do have a chance to, to meet a lot of other mayors and talk to a lot of mayors. We get inter do a lot of inner city visits. I get invited to come tell Greenville story. Other mayors come here. The mayor of Grand Rapids was here just recently. We brought our whole senior staff to see what we've done in Greenville. Yeah, it happens all the time. But I think one of my crazier, funny stories is um, it wasn't the NCAA, but it was the eclipse. <laughs> you know, we, yeah, so Greenville was one of those cities that had the full eclipse. Are you all here during that? Yeah. yeah. And, and that was one we kind of almost missed in terms of realizing what an impact it would have. It was like, it was like a mini NCAA. We had people all over the country, all over the country who checked it out online. So this looks like a good place to see it. And, um, and then six months later came the stories. So one of my favorite is a, uh, um, I don't think what they, what they call the, uh, uh, Greenville, what does he call the city? Uh, what's he called? Oh, let me think here. This is a good story if I can remember. <laughs> uh, named, it's more the Greenville Drive path. I'll give you the little round, round version of it. So a uh, prominent businessman in Richmond, Virginia, <clears throat> uh, came to the eclipse. And two, two or three years later, he calls me. He brings a kind of a CEO roundtable from Richmond to Greenville to see downtown Greenville just before COVID. Because Richmond, Virginia, according to him, and he's a major CEO of a major company in Richmond, it, politically and otherwise, it's kind of a mess, okay? <laughs> and, and they wanted to see, see Greenville and everything. But the story was that he, um, he came, came here for the eclipse and just couldn't believe the city and kind of looked us under the hood and went all around and everything else. Uh, went to the Greenville Drive baseball game and uh, bought all the Greenville Drive baseball hats you, you could possibly buy. And um, talks about Greenville so much, he said. He said, I'm going to tell you a story. And I'm almost a little bit embarrassed to tell you this story. How much do I love your city? I talk about your city so much. 
that when I had my first grandchild, my son and daughter said, we're going to give you a name, grand grandpa. Your name's going to be G for Greenville. <laughs> I said, really? He said, yep, it's my name, Papa G. And uh, that's the story. So that's, I mean, now I, I told you, I, I see a lot of other mayors. The reason I tell you that, they don't have stories like that. It's like, I tell them, people, they, oh, they never heard that kind of thing. So we get amazing, uh, surprising feedback from all kind of, all kind of places and such. But I'd like to think it's because we have done a good job. And this is a broader community thing. It's not about me. It's not about the city so much altogether, too. Well, I didn't see it. Really has always been good about planning. Going back decades, 100 years, good planners. And Greenville's always been good about partnerships, public-private partnerships, and people being collaborative and working together. And in today's world, that's really a rarity. And as we have inner city visits of people come here from other cities, Jacksonville, Grand Rapids, et cetera, <clears throat> I realize more and more how rare that is. That, that attitude is, is under attack everywhere, but in a lot of communities, uh, it's, it's a hard one to, to maintain. We, we honestly still have it, I'm happy to tell you. I can still tell you that all these projects that I'm talking about and what's to come, um, Unity Park being a great example, the public-private partnership, the willingness of the uh, corporate community, the willingness of people generally to work together is still very strong in this town. And it's a, it's a wonderful, maybe it's in the drinking water, the really great drinking water. Um, whatever it is, it's um, it's a great virtue and it helps my, make my job so much easier than other jobs. In fact, I spent the morning, you know, now think about it. Okay, what I do this morning? This morning I called about three uh, CEOs and a neighborhood leader, um, four different people, four different unrelated things. But what they have in common is they're all collaborators with the city. You know, they, how can I help? How can I help? How can I help? And that's a great thing to have. So um, feel free, by the way, to use that Greenville G story. <laughs> Do your own Greenville G. Um, what we have coming up now, <clears throat> the way I usually describe our, our workload in the city, we have the big uh, our former city manager, we got John Castile. And John, John called them the big boulders. <laughs> they're the big projects that we spent enormous amount of time on pushing a rock up the hill uh, to make happen. That was Falls Park. That was baseball downtown. Um, a lot of other projects. Years ago, it was the arena that the NCAA now plays in. Um, so we have big boulders. And then we have lots of other things that are just going on, ongoing projects that we, that we are um, sort of near and dear to us. And that's our neighborhood initiative. We're floating up um, $34 million bond to for neighborhood improvements. Uh, it actually, it's supplemental to what we already do. We do more new sidewalk construction in the city of Greenville than any city in South Carolina or North Carolina. No one even comes close building sidewalks. And there's an ideology behind <coughs> that philosophy. Why do we build sidewalks? We, we're all about neighborhoods and it's the number one thing people want. And why we do that. Um, and then a lot of other neighborhood improvements, neighborhood parks and all. That, that's ongoing and we still do big, bold things in that regard. Um, but on the big boulders right now, so what's on our list? Um, I'll just kind of tick off a few. You can do questions and answers. You can ask about a lot more. Uh, oh, gosh, there's the downtown conference center. <clears throat> Hard one. Can't say it may not work out. Uh, we've been working on it. We have a location on the river. What's the, better, what's the best place to put visitors at conferences in Greenville, perhaps if you're the first time, what's the best place to put them? I think the river's a pretty good place to put them. We're fortunate to have uh, some folks who own the property on the river. It's the only piece of property left on the river. There is no more. After that, it's all parkland and everything. And uh, these, these folks are willing to donate it um, for the conference center. Now, they'll come out fine because they'll, they'll build around it and benefit by it. Uh, but it's still a pretty amazing thing because I can tell you they could make more money quicker just by selling their, their land today. Um, the conference center is complicated, involves the state of South Carolina, involves the county of Greenville. <laughs> That's all that matter. Um, so far, so good. And um, we hope we can work it out. There, but there are complications of you know, construction costs is out of this world right now. We're trying to work on the size, how big it has to be. We're we'll back and forth on that. We're not interested, we're not building, by the way, a big convention center. Forget that idea. This is a conference center. It's high tech, it's smaller spaces. It's focused on bringing people to Greenville who don't live here. So when you go to the boat show or home and garden show, that'll still be out at the old home. So 
This is for something totally different, it's economic development oriented on the river. Uh, we have that one going on. Uh, we are still working on moving City Hall. Um, I want to move it to the Bowwater building next to the waterfall. Um, the current City Hall built in the 70s. It's about as bad a place to work as you possibly could. Floor, nothing, nothing about it's good. The, nothing works. <laughs> uh, it's, I, I wouldn't want my worst enemy sometimes working in some of those floors. It's just a, a bad little bill. It's a great location, though, and we want to sell it to somebody who can completely renovate it and make it a, a great architecturally change the building. So we're looking at putting it out on the market, but first we've got to find a place for ourselves. And, and here's what we did learn in the last year or so. We learned that we don't need as much space as we used to think we needed. With COVID and other things, we put, to other, we put some departments outside the building, and they're happy there, and they, will, they don't want to come back. So we only, in, if the, the Bow, I, come, I call it the Bowwater building. It used to be a company called Bowwater there, right next to the Bohemian Hotel um, office building at the waterfall. Uh, it's got four floors. We think, and we realize now, unlike, year ago when we first started, we don't need four floors. We could probably make the one too. Uh, this is kind of in the weeds for you, but one, one of the other reasons we want to leave the current site is the city council chamber is on the 10th floor, which makes why they did that back in those, I have no idea. It means you have to get on the elevator and go up. Now, I've been doing this a long time, so I see, so maybe we'll have a zoning here, you know, neighbor against neighbor. <laughs> and they're on the 10th floor fighting it out and then, then time for the agenda to change and all the same people get on the elevator <laughs> get on the elevator together so maybe it's a good thing I don't know but nobody's killed killed each other or anything like that. but uh but 10th floor is not where your public meeting space should be it should be on the first floor absolutely first floor so that's how this started by the way we were looking for a way to move it and then we realized it was, was going to cost so much money to build a, a meeting hall on the first floor that got us thinking, well, maybe look at a different location. I think for Greenville City, I think it should, City Hall should be on Main Street. I believe that strongly. Uh, one exception, if we could have a City Hall next to the waterfall, I'll take that. Um, I think it's world class. And, and so we're working on that. So we, we got a new, working on a partnership where maybe the city buys half of it and somebody else buys the other half. We don't need the whole thing. So we can cut the cost dramatically. So we're working on that. Uh, we're working on uh, parking in the West End, and they sound kind of pedestrian, but it should have been done 15 years ago. Uh, and it's hard to find a piece of property to build a parking garage in the West End of Greenville, but we have one, and I'm crossing my fingers that we'll be able to do that. Uh, and then, of course, Unity Park. Uh, Unity Park's been about 10 years in the making, or longer, depending on how you want to say, start it. And um, we would not be where we are today on Unity Park, were it not for George Fletcher being on city council at the moment in time he was, because we were pretty stuck on removing our public works facility, which has been down there for a long time. We had to clear the area up first, and, and his support was critical to do that. Uh, Unity Park opens in May, or let's call it phase one of Unity Park. We have more to do, but we decided what the heck, let's just open what we have, which is gonna be pretty spectacular. A uni park is 60 acres. For those who are new to Greenville or even those here understand there's there's a there's a there's a two aspects of this whole project. It's beautiful green space and parkland, 60 acres created in the middle of, of the city, just at the time we need it the most. Greenville's growing fast, real fast. We got to balance the growth. How do you do it? Well, one thing you certainly better do is create green space and parks. So we are doing that. We're so fortunate have a chance to do that. And the reason we have a chance to do that, to create green space in 2022 in the middle of the town, big new park. The reason we do it is for over, like over hundred years, the city of Greenville has owned property in and around this area along the river. Um, it's been warehouses. It once had the city jail back in the 1930s and 40s. The jail was down there, the public works department. It was down there for about 30 years. <clears throat> it's basically kind of a throwaway backyard of Greenville. It's adjacent to some residential neighborhoods, but the, the area itself has never had a house on it. It's always been industrial. And that's been difficult, but that gave us the opportunity to do this, which is amazing. So we had to, it's not been easy, but we've worked through buying up additional properties. And we got that to go. Well, that's part of the narrative. But the other part of the narrative is, is why the name is Unity Park. So know this. Within this larger area, there were two, for almost 100 years, there were two small parks. 
within this bigger industrial area. One of them was the Black Park and one was the White Park, Mayberry Park in their book. So um, Unity Park is an expression of acknowledging that history, if you will, and, 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 and going to a new direction. As you may have seen in the renderings, there's a 10-story observation tower, which we're still in the process of raising money for, but we will build it. And architecturally, it will be as stunning as the Liberty Bridge. It is not some mere um, observation tower. It's beautiful. And that observation tower uh, sits exactly between the old two parks, hence Uni Park. The neighborhoods around it, <clears throat> southern side area, uh, the leadership in the southern side area has always wanted a park. I heard about this decades ago. But it turned out, it turned out, in fact, that back in 1938, uh, the city of Greenville promised the southern side neighborhood that there'd be a park. It never happened. 75 years later, it's finally happened. And there's a whole history and narrative of that story, who was involved and how it happened. Uh, instead, the city of Greenville continued basically to just put things like the jail down there. We had two, we had two landfills down there. Uh, in 1940s and 50s, they had a police firing range down there. And the reason that's so interesting, but I didn't know about this until we started digging all this stuff out. The police firing range was open to the public on weekends. <laughs> so Mary Duckett of the Southern Side neighborhood and others used to tell me, no kidding, the people in the Southern Side neighborhood adjacent used to have bullet holes in their houses. Um, so the story, that's the whole, so that's the bigger narrative. Now, understanding and acknowledging the changes in that neighborhood, with people coming in and buying land, in fact, we have a couple uh, sort of close to million dollar condos built around this area, which by the way, talk about confidence in the city, people actually moving into that area before the park's even built. That's a big change from years ago. Um, but again, the city owns land in this area not just the park area, but we own other property. We own all the, we own all the beachfront property to the park, the edge property. We made a decision in Georgia on city council about five, six years ago to donate all of the property the city owns on the edge. It's valued at around $9 million conservatively. We donated it all to the, to the housing trust fund for affordable housing. So we're gonna build a beautiful green space park and it'll be surrounded by the largest footprint of affordable housing in the entire city, close to 600 units is the plan. And we are rocking and rolling on this, by the way. This is not some green, no, we're, we're moving, moving. Uh, first groundbreakings will happen shortly, on senior housing project, and then some others come right after that. And they're all really good stuff. The neighborhood around the park, in other words, if you go up, project ahead about 10 years, the neighborhood around Unity Park will be the most diverse, certainly in terms of, of uh, a, a different income demographics of any place in the city. You will have two or three million dollar condo people living right next door to what we call workforce housing, all architecturally quite beautiful and well-designed. Uh, so that's gonna be the, the vision of Union Park. By the way, in, in across the country, across <coughs> America right now, there's probably more park construction going on at any time in recent history. Nashville has a park project that they've been working through. Raleigh has a major park they're trying to get the first base on um, near the campus of NC State. Um, I've been to all of them. And what they all have in common is that they're dealing with those same issues we woke up to early. We, we did wake up to it eight or nine years ago, which was, you know, we know by building this, it's going to cause more gentrification. And everything. We know that. You can already see it. But we're going to actually try to do something about you know, how to kind of work into it. And well, they're, they've been really slow to figure this out and they're trying to figure out how to address it. And in our case, we're frankly we're fortunate we, we, because we owned all this property on the edge of the park. In the case of Raleigh, they don't have that option. So they're actually thinking about carving out a section of their <coughs> park to do some affordable housing and such, which they may have to do. But uh, we're in a good, good spot on that. I, I, I say that too because I think we're going to be a model. I know we are a model across the country of how to do this kind of project in, in 2022. So we got Unity Park opening soon. 
uh, just get back to the fun part of that story too. Uh, that park is gonna have lots of green space. I mentioned public-private partnerships are strong in Greenville. Uh, it is a public-private partnership. Um, and as is most of the parks around the country, by the way, now. That's new. You never would have heard that 50 years ago. But now you just can't do these things without having some private money in it. It really started with Millennial Park in Chicago. They were the first major park project in the United States that I know of that, that was really a public private partnership. Um, ours will be too. And so, for example, we have a large green space. We have two large, just big green spaces. And one of them will be called Michelin Green. But Michelin gave us a million dollars. Uh, Prisma is a million dollars. We have many, many contributions of 500,000, 250,000, 100,000 from major companies and people in Greenville who just kind of showed up um, to contribute to the park. And so we have, we've raised around 15 million in private money, which is matched against say 24, 25 million in public money. So that's how you, that's how you build a park these days. Uh, park opens in May and again, a lot of green space. The, the Swamp River Trail runs right through the middle of it. But we, as you may know, if you've been over there, the section running through the park is a whole new section. It's wider than the normal Swamp River Trail and you can get off the trail and actually go zigzag around the park. Uh, it's built that way. We took the Reedy River, which was channelized in 1934, I think it is. Um, and they did a horrible job in 1934 because they had different, they just dug a ditch. So, well, how do we end flooding? We'll just dig a ditch deeper. <laughs> we totally bulldozed the Reedy River and, and then used modern and environmentally sensitive, correct ways to, to rebuild a waterway. So now if you go down near the Reedy River, it looks completely different from what it looked like just two years ago. It's beautiful. I told someone the other day when I was down there, the, the sun was glistening on the Reedy River. Never thought I'd use the word glistening in Reedy River in the same sentence. But it is, and it does. It's absolutely beautiful now. So the river is restored, uh, environmentally more healthy. It's good for, for flood control. It's better, too. Um, then we have, um, for those who have grandchildren, I mean, to tell you this, you know, you look at pictures and plans. In this case, we raised lots of money to support the playground area. Of the park. And I'm going to tell you, better than I've ever dreamed of. And everybody who's involved in the project has had the same reaction. It's about 80% complete. It's not complete yet, but, you, but those of us who can go over there and go behind the fence, and everybody's had the same reaction. This is incredible. It is not your everyday playground. It's all natural. It's mountains and things to climb and hills and valleys and um, things that you can slide down. Um, it is just awesome. And it includes the largest spray park, water park, if you will, in all of Greenville. And I, I was, we, we got a $500,000 donor for the spray park, for example, many years ago. Um, and I remember telling them, hey, you give us the money. And by the way, it will not just be any children's, children's spray park. It'll be the best spray park in all of Greenville. Um, <laughs> and I saw the pictures. It really is. It really is. It's enormous in size. Oh my gosh. And there's a whole section for little kids where the jets only come up to this high. And then there's a section for big kids and grown ups who want to get in the spray park and get wet. So, it, so the park is going to have some amazing features. And on top of everything else, getting back to public private partnerships, as you may know, we have this thing called the Greenville Commons down there. Commons is a food hall. And we have the food hall down there that's a private, a privately owned effort right in the middle of the park. They bought the warehouses in the middle of the park, uh, which was not in the original plan for the park. But things like this happen to us all the time. This, this party comes in and they renovated these old warehouses and now it's going to be in this architect's firm. It's a software company. It's a marketing company. It's a huge bicycle uh, dealership. Um, it's a uh, brew pub. And then there's the commons, which is a food court. Of a good quality. And that's and what you see. If you go down there now, uh, what you see is only one half of what they're going to have. That's just phase one of a two part food court. I say all that because we started the park process, and these people appeared on the scene. Our park designers, who are from Columbus, Ohio, and they do parks, have done parks around the country. I remember when they said about that, they said, you know, usually you build a park and you hope somebody will bring in a food truck or something. <laughs> and ours is going to have an entire built in food hall on top of everything else. So it's, it's just gonna be, gonna be just absolutely amazing. Um, 
touch on a few other things. Well, anyway, that's on the public sector side. I'm about to run out of time. We'll take questions. We've got 10 minutes for some questions. We have lots of projects, hotels, apartments, condos. In case you wondered, yes, more is coming, and uh, we look for a big year in 22, 22 yes, 23. So thanks. Have you ever considered putting in a permanent farmer's market? They look at the one they have over at Raleigh's and yeah. that's the farmer's market. And they think a farmer's market is really good yeah. not just on Saturday morning. Yeah, it's a good, it's a good point. It, we probably will grow the one. It was, uh, it was a big push at the time just to get a Saturday farmer's market uh, here, but we did it. And Traveler's Rest has a really nice one now. We, a lot of these things we do in the city, which I, which I love, get, get imitated by the other municipalities. The whole, you know, downtown Greer is great. Downtown Simpsonville is coming along great. Traveler's Rest is fantastic. I love the fact they take these things and run with it. Um, there's uh, the answer is going to yes and no. It, it, it is out there. It, we, could, we, could, we could absolutely support something more permanent. Judson Mill is putting together something kind of like that over the Judson Mill renovation. Thank you. I have two questions about the Everything on the housing side, I mean, down to the detail, is all coordinated by the Southern Side Neighborhood Association. Um, the planning process, down to the color of the, of the buildings, is all vetted by the association. So we have a great partnership and always have with the neighborhood. All of our neighborhood plans have input from the neighborhoods. And that sometimes people, even the, sometimes the critics come around and say, oh, we don't have uh, or we have, in one case, you're criticized for having too much home ownership. Then you have other neighborhoods that want to have more home ownership. Truth is, you want both. You want rental and you want home ownership. And it's very much led by the neighborhoods themselves. They live there. They want to know there's a good good balance between between the two. I'm happy to say, yes, the uh, mod, you know what's great about modern, uh, just like I mentioned, the river is being renovated the way it ought to be done. <laughs> and they did such a bad job in the 1930s. They didn't know what they were doing. And now we do uh, same thing on playgrounds. You know, it's wonderful. It was great from day one. Oh, that's very handicap accessible. It's got all kinds of elements to it that are beyond. It may not be apparent to the outsider, but it actually is. Um, we're also working, by the way, with a private group to build uh, a playground for severely uh, uh, handicapped children uh, in Cleveland Park. So watch for that. It, it will be done because we have private money. We can do something that's not just okay. It's actually going to be really spectacular. But there are elements of this one too. In uh, baseball city, yeah. a terrific job. Terrific businesses, down the course, that end of the main street. Yeah. What I'm seeing now is that businesses on the north part of Main Street, I think a lot of vacant yeah. uh, storefronts and that kind of thing. Any thoughts as to how we rush yeah. bring those businesses back? Well, that's a really good point. No, we really, pardon me real quick. Can you all hear me? Do you mind repeating the question so the people? Yeah, are yeah. That? yeah, he was asking a very, a very perceptive question about as the river area becomes such a hot area to be in and, and the West End around the baseball stadium in terms of retail, you're probably talking about retail in particular, and office, what about the relative weaker conditions, say, of the area around the Hyatt Hotel on the northern side? Uh, to answer your question, we're really, we, that's exactly how we think. Um, we focus, in fact, we have our focus on like retail recruitment and it only focuses on the North End because of that issue. And it is true, we're constantly watching. We actually do counts on the weekends to see how we're coming in terms of where the crowds are and, 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 it, and they do it kind of ebbs and flows. But I think one of the beauties of downtown Greenville is we've always been mindful of that. So the reason the one project happened where anthropology is in one plaza and all that, that was part of an effort years ago to, to address exactly that issue because we were really seeing things move to the river so fast and things just were almost dying up down that end. So we made extra effort and were successful in getting the one project. And uh, we will we will fill all the vacancies. We're actively engaged with the landowners to try to plug those holes to do exactly that. One good thing on the north end, um, an old department store building, Ivy's department store, for those who know, there's a huge building next to the Hyatt that is now for sale. 
and uh, watch that because that's an that's a blockbuster opportunity for something big to happen on that end of Main Street. You're absolutely correct. We have to constantly watch that, and we, and we do. It's it's always a moving target there because it is hard. We you know we have I had a retailer in the other week, and they want they want to be in the West End. You know we couldn't couldn't twist their arm to sway them, but we but we try really hard to kind of hey come up there and work be on the North End too. Yes, ma'am. Wonder about the old Memorial Hall. Memorial Auditorium. Happy. I, I could probably the more in Greenville when we built the arena where the NCAA played, we formerly had an old auditorium built in the 1940s, early 50s. It was like a rock, a big old building. And when the arena was built, unfortunately, as a kind of non-compete idea, they required the investors required the old arena, the old auditorium to be torn down. And that was in gosh, 1996 or seven. That site has been empty ever since. Uh, it is not owned by the city. It is not owned by the county. It's a privately owned piece of property. And uh, it's had, it's really been quite snake bitten, uh, but it's kind of like this uh, for about five years, the, the federal government had it under contract. So it was tied up for five years to put the federal courthouse in until they change their mind. And then you have recessions and everything else. I'm happy to tell you, it hasn't been in the newspaper and I'm sure no one will reveal this, right? <laughs> it's under contract again. Well, they have a close in the contract, but it is under contract again by a developer who has really deep pockets and ability to do something really big. So um, I think it's been one of the issues. It's um, ex real expensive property. So it's hard to get somebody who has the wherewithal to buy it and then do something on it. It's, it's a tough one to do something on. Uh, could you address the staff, current status of the city annexating the West Village, specifically along Kendall Street? Uh, which building? I'm sorry. The, the area. No, annexation in general. In West Greenville, in, in the village area, is that what you yeah. mean? Uh, yeah, I appreciate the question, annexation. Long and short is uh, the city has never done the kind of job we should do on annexation. And that's why our physical footprint of the city is smaller than it should be. Uh, that is going to change. <laughs> we are actively and energetically uh, annexing and we'll be annexing a lot more. Um, I, I believe strongly in this. It's a, it's, it's a, in South Carolina law, it is hard to annex. It's in North Carolina. If we were in North Carolina, our, our population would be like three times it is in South Carolina because in North Carolina, their annexation laws are completely different from South Carolina. And so Charleston, Columbia, Greenville, all are relatively small footprints compared to what they could be. Nonetheless, it is, while it's hard, uh, we're going to be focused on it. So I believe strongly in it for a couple of reasons, and none of them have to do with the finances. I mean, we, it's not about tax dollars, because in some things you annex, you have to lose money. Um, but I do believe into it in terms of building the population of the city vis-a-vis -vis the county. And I think it's important because I think long term, the voice the city has on Greenville County is determined by our economic strength and our population. And we've certainly made ourselves relevant. When I came in as mayor, I think the issue was, is the city even relevant anymore? I mean, we were, an, we were a hollow core in the middle of a growing county. People were not buying houses in the city. They were not building apartments anywhere in the city. They were, I mean, everything you see now is a total mirror image of where we started. Now we're strong, we're desirable. People, people are trying to find land in the city to build things. And on annexation, um, you know, I believe in it because more, more of it's in the, it gives us a bigger voice in our communities. The second reason is we're good at planning. And if something's in the county, good luck, you're on your own. If you're in the city, you get the full resources in Greenville City in terms of planning and such. And third, here's a real shocker for everybody, headline news. If you live out or have a business outside of the city of Greenville on the west side, that's the area you're talking about, um, Parker District, or Gantt District, anything on the west side of Greenville, uh, if, you, if you're out there, you pay taxes that are higher than when you pay when you come into city of Greenville. And that's always a shock to people. They can't believe it. And we've had many meetings where they're also they're like, what? Uh, because you don't get the services, you don't get the police protection, you don't get the planning and all that stuff. So we have a good argument to make. We just don't do it enough. Yes, sir. Yeah, um, through Holly, we've uh, taken many tours of Greenville's facilities, uh, including the Park District, uh, Falls Park, 
hmm. transportation department, and most recently the public works oh, department. Thank you. And um, I just want to say that the uh, the attitude, the professionalism, yeah. and, uh, just everything, uh, every single department that we have been in has been spectacular. Yeah. So congratulations. I'm really proud of them. I love the public works department. I'm heavily biased in that direction. The employees don't get enough. They don't get paid well enough. They don't get the things they need. But all, I, I think I started this whole talk out about sidewalks. You see, I can't get that, man. You know, the people who build the sidewalks, who keep our parks looking like they do, it's all public works department. And they do a great job, way beyond the call of duty. And so it was a wonderful thing when we moved the public works department out of the area that today is Unity Park. Uh, they were in a horrible place, cinder block buildings, disgusting working conditions and cramped and crowded. And they were in a flood zone, they used to flood at Public Works on a regular basis. We took that whole department, built them a beautiful, I could proudly say it's a Taj Mahal. They deserve a Taj Mahal. It, you saw it, you could eat off the floor, right? I mean, it looks like looks like Boeing Airliners are being made there or something. You could eat off the floor and uh, it's it's done great for morale. And uh, we have a just a wonderful Public Works department. And they win all these national awards all the time. Right? Number one in the country. The fleet management is like number one in the country. So our fleet guys, these are just great people who do this kind of thing. So they went to their, um, they've won it several times, but they, the first time it happened, they went to their national conference in Chicago. And these are big guys who pick up your trash, fix the trucks and all that. And we made sure a bunch of them got to go to the National Public Works Conference in Chicago. And they have the wonderful story of sitting there. They were being nominated for like, you know, best fleet in America. And it was time for the top 10 to be announced. And they announced number 10. And these are cities. This is, you know, Cleveland, Ohio, and all this, Denver, Colorado, all big name cities were getting the awards. And they got down to about number three. <laughs> and one of them said to the boss, well, you know, I had to use a restaurant. Well, obviously we're not getting an award. You know, they, they were very uh, <laughs> down and depressed. They, they didn't make the top 10. They were number one. <laughs> they were so excited. They were so excited about it. So, yeah, thank you for that. Um, one last. One last. Question. Okay. You know, let me end on that note. That's a good one. Yeah. Yeah. Swamp Rabbit Trail. Just for the record, we started the Swamp Rabbit Trail because we built a trail that went nowhere. <laughs> it just went through the city and then stopped. And uh, years later, uh, it was. And I want to give kudos. It was, a, it was a master plan done by the city county master plan about 15 years ago uh, that was put together at our behest, city and county paid for it by Clemson University. And the Clemson, I'm gonna enough, uh, thanks for it. And in that Clemson, it was called the Reedy River Master Plan. We hired Clemson University to look at the Reedy River and talk about, we, we just opened Falls Park. Well, this is good, this is good. People like the river. And one, they know it's there now. Number two, they like it. So what do we do with it? And it was, it was this master plan process, a lot of citizen input, a lot of participation. But I love the plan because that plan laid out two big ideas that I promise you was not on people's minds until they did this. That's if we're good planners. You always have to bring a planner in. They said two ideas. One, you could build a walking and bike trail from Traveler's Rest into downtown Rhythm. You could do this. It's an old rail line. So people weren't focused on it at that point. Number two, you've got an area, a vast area in the city of Greenville to build a new park, which had been kind of talked about for years. We've got to move on this. So both those were in that plan. And it's pretty good, it's pretty good for government work that in less than 10 years, both were on their way to being accomplished. That's pretty darn good. Uh, so the county adopted the plan, and that's how the county first said, oh, we can do this. And they adopted a hospitality tax too. To do their extension. You know, we had already built, we built the trail in the city, but the problem with that is it doesn't go very far. And then we shot it the other way. So on your question, where it is now is uh, 15 years later, um, we went to the county and said, we have another idea, which is we have another abandoned rail line that runs through the city parallel to Lawrence Road. And we took everybody on a walking tour and that's how that happened, that we would do another section of the trail. And it is uh, underway, under construction. Uh, the only fly in the ointment has been uh, the crossings, because one of the lessons takeaways of the existing swamp rabbit is you have to cross those horrible highways. And we just decided the city council, and this majority is still on, get George plug here in there too, that we didn't want to do that in the city. So we said, you know what, county, y'all build the trail. Thank you very much. About six miles over to Verde, Hollingsworth. 
and we will do the, um, um, we'll do bridges, we'll pay for bridges, thinking that they cost around I don't know, $3 million. <laughs> Eight, nine million dollars later, <laughs> it slowed us down. Now we're, we're just gonna live like we're gonna build, a, we're building the bridges. So, so this one section is gonna be great. It, it parallels Lawrence Road, it runs right through apartments and subdivisions, and, it, and it's gonna, and it's already changing the whole look and feel of Lawrence Road with restaurants and shops and stores. That's the result. I know many of you might have more questions. We're going to ask because the next class is waiting. We're going to ask Knox to walk out that door. Oh, okay. And those of you who want to ask the questions, walk out that door so we can let the other people come in. Let's thank Knox. Uh, thank you. On on behalf of the Zoom participants, thank you, thank you, Mayor White and Sarah. Oh, she said I have to go outside. Yeah, I'm yeah. Sorry. I bet the owner of Latitudes restaurant wish she could have hang it, hung oh, it there. Yeah. I love Latitudes. It was a great restaurant. I can't believe it. Yeah. The West End is now soon. Yeah, that's true. They were there before anybody else. Right. Oh, okay. Hold on. That's right. I'm going to escort you. Yeah. By the way, that was a long time. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> it'll be done. It'll be done.